precious name of Amen. Amen. Um, which camera I'm using? One minute. I don't know. Um, yeah, it says Logitech. Mm. All right. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to BC213. Recording is on. Uh, we just prayed together. And uh, last week, we went through Matthew chapter 24. Um, just, you know, we went, we um, saw some of the things that the Lord Jesus shared with his disciples when they asked him about the, the signs of the end times. Uh, were there any questions that we did not answer, I think? Uh, I forgot what was it. Oh, what was the question? Let me... Let me um, okay, let me see. Okay, do we... Uh, let me see if I did I record the questions. Oh. Sorry, I, I didn't keep the questions. Oh. Oh, I didn't record it. Okay. So, um, do, we, do we know what the questions were? Um, okay. Okay. So, Chaya Paul's question How will we know about the mark of the beast? So, okay. So, this is a question. Thank you. So, in Revelation chapter 13, we read about the mark of the beast. And um, so it's a mark that is uh, introduced by the Antichrist and the false prophet. So they are working together. And the Antichrist introduces this mark. And uh, people are forced to have the mark of the beast on the right hand or on the forehead. And only if you have this mark can you buy and sell. So, example, if you go to the grocery store, you want to buy something or any, any kind of thing you want to do, only if you have this mark can you buy and sell. Um, and then Revelation 13 says, you know, this mark is 666, right? So the question is, um, one is... Um, how is he going to actually do this, right? How is he going to have people everywhere to receive a mark on their hand or on their forehead? So literally, it's on their body, right? And uh, it can just be scanned. Now, the technology to make this happen is there, right? So if uh, somebody, I mean, if people want to, you can put one small little implant here. And uh, you can actually, you know, your actually all of your data, your life data can be accessed if, if we want to do that. The technology to make these things happen is already there. And um, so that's not a difficult thing. Uh, what exactly this number would be? Uh, the Bible just says 666, which doesn't mean that, you know, every time you see 666, we should get scared. Um, uh, it, it could be something that uh, we don't know the interpretation of it. But I, I would say two things. One, we don't have to be afraid because we won't be around when that is happening. That is in Revelation 13. It's after the middle of the seven years of tribulation. It's the second half of the tribulation when it, this will be introduced. We won't be here. Second, the way we can find out is it will be introduced by the Antichrist and the false prophet. And uh, the way somebody can recognize it is, hey, you're being forced to take that. And only if you have that, can you buy and sell. And along with that, you are forced to worship the Antichrist. So these are the two criteria that we can look at. Revelation 13 makes it very clear that... You have to have this mark, only then you can buy and sell. And this mark is telling, is an expression that you are submitting to the Antichrist. Right? So that's how you know that this is, you know, that particular mark. 
And it's not like everybody, every time somebody says, you know, put a badge, oh, it's the Antichrist. No, this is the criteria. So that's how we can recognize it. But uh, as believers, we don't have to be afraid because we're not going to be around at that time. Revelation 13 uh, explains all of this. I hope it's, I uh, hope we answered your question, Chaya. All right. Um, what was the second question? What was the other question? Uh, no. On the third day when Jesus arrives, the, the tombs are open. Uh, like, what are actually those? And when compared to this, when Jesus when Jesus come, the second coming, the tombs will be. Is there any compassion for that? And what was that? And what was this? OK, OK. So um, um, so what we do know is this. So this is where you look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and also 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So in Ephesians chapter 4, verses um, 8, 9, 10, um, the Bible says that when Jesus ascended, he took captivity captive with him. Okay. That means when the Lord Jesus ascended into heaven, all those people, the Old Testament saints, who were held captive in Abraham's bosom, that means they were kept there in Abraham's bosom. They were taken with Jesus into heaven. So paradise moved from being in Abraham's bosom, which was a part of Hades. Paradise moved from there to the third heaven, to heaven itself. So Ephesians 4, 8 to 10 describes that. But that happened when Jesus ascended. Now, Jesus, after his resurrection, there were, there were two ascensions. So what do you mean? So after Jesus ro rose up from the dead, he ascended into heaven to enter into the most holy place with his own precious blood. So that time he told Mary, don't touch me, because I have not yet ascended to my father. So he had one more work to do. After his resurrection, he had to go into the most holy place and enter the most holy place and present his blood. So we read about that in Hebrews, I think it's Hebrews um, chapter 8. Um, um, let me see now. Okay, Hebrews 8 describes this uh, this tabernacle, this which is in heaven. And then Hebrews 9, uh, verse 12, not with the blood of goats and cows, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Right? Hebrews 9, verse 12. That means he's saying, he entered into the most holy place with his own blood. So that's why when on, on, on that resurrection morning in the garden, when Mary Magdalene saw him and she was about to fall on his feet and touch him, he said, don't touch me. I've not yet ascended. So he ascended, he went into the most holy place, presented the blood. Then he came back for the next 40 days. He was showing himself alive to his disciples. That time he said, touch me. He told Thomas, Thomas, touch, put your hand on my side, no problem. Because he had finished that work. And then after 40 days from the Mount of Olives, he ascended into heaven and he's there, seated at the right hand of the Father. Right. So when he ascended into heaven, Ephesians 4, 8 through 10, he took the saints, Old Testament saints, their spirits, not their bodies, their spirits with them. Now, why we say that they were not resurrected physically at that time is because uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 and also uh, end of Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that we will be perfected together. That means verse Hebrews 11, 39 
that the Old Testament people of faith will not be made perfect apart from us. Or we could say Hebrews 11, 13, and 40, we will be made perfect together. Okay. So that resurrection, so uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when Christ comes, he will bring those who have died with him, the spirits with him. And that time we will all receive glorified bodies. Okay. So then the question is, what happened when the night, the night Jesus was crucified? Because the graves were opened. And people saw, not everybody, but they saw some people come out of the graves. Matthew 24, sorry, Matthew 27 records that. Huh? So what was that about, right? Um, I think, let me just see here. That when he was, uh, yeah, Matthew 27, 52, 51, 52. Right? Mm. And so notice it says, and the graves were open. Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Coming out of the graves after his resurrection. So, you know, 51, 52, 53. is something that not didn't happen just at that moment what happened from between crucifixion and resurrection because you're saying see verse 53 coming out of the graves after his resurrection okay they went in the holy city and appeared to many but here's the problem the question is were these people physically raised or was it something like how Peter, James, and John saw Elijah and Moses? It, that they saw on the Mount of Transfiguration Elijah and Moses. But we know Elijah and Moses um, were not in their physical bodies walking there. Right? But they saw they saw them saw Jesus transfigure. So it was something different. It was not literal uh, physical bodies suddenly walking there. So my uh, and again, this is you know because this is the only passage that describes this. It's uh, you know it's it's open to interpretation. That means you know we can't so okay hundred percent. If we had two or three passages, we can put it all together and say. But my un understanding of this is, if you, if you have to be consistent with all the other passages in Scripture, that means we are all going to receive our glorified bodies. We are going to be made perfect together. Right? They, without us, will not be made perfect. So the Old Testament saints will be made perfect with us. So that's why I feel that that time of everybody receiving glorified bodies will be in First Thessalonians chapter 4. Therefore, here, what Matthew 27, 51 to 53, my, uh, so my, I would say my personal or my opinion on this, my, my understanding of this would be that their spirits came and they saw them in the spirit, spiritual expression, not their physical bodies, because then uh, it would be something happening before God's appointed time. Right? So that's my understanding. Now I know some people may say differently. That's okay. We don't need to fight about it, you know, because there's only one passage that we have. But keeping everything consistent, I would say, okay, here these the spirits of these people were, were made visible. A few people were made visible to those who knew them in Jerusalem. And then I say, this person was dead, this person was dead, but at that moment, God did it as a sign, and as a wonder, uh, showing that Jesus is, remember Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, he was the first person 
to be resurrected, never to die again. Right? So it, it, Jesus had to be first physically. And these people appeared, the spirits appeared to those who knew them. But them receiving their immortal bodies will all take place in First Thessalonians chapter 4, according to First Thessalonians 4. So that's how I would understand this passage. But, uh, you know, I'm sure that there would be others who have different interpretations of it, and that is fine. We don't have to fight about it because uh, this is the only passage we have. It's okay. Yes, Prince. Uh, any other questions from online students as well? Uh, well, we explain. You're welcome. Uh, so like uh, we talking about the rapture, and we see uh, like even I asked last time like will all the believers will be uh, taken up mm -hmm. during mm -hmm. the rapture, and uh, we have said like yeah uh, no like all the believers who believed in the name of Jesus will be that taken up mm. and uh, like even last time we have seen an example of one pastor like from an african pastor mm -hmm. yeah so like so and uh, even jesus uh, tells about this uh, people right false like, prophets yeah and those who do things so yeah. even even now there are people who are like that like uh, false prophets yeah. who are like in the name of jesus but they are not living according to his word so will they will also be raptured or will they be left behind so is those who are not believers, who are not true believers, will not be raptured. But there are people who have believed Jesus, but like that pastor we have seen, he was he believed in Jesus. Right? So you're talking about people, say example, you're talking about people in the congregation. Are you talking about people in the congregation who believe? No. Like. So is your question? That people, there are people who believed in Jesus, yeah. but then they got deceived and went yeah, away. They got deceived and they went away. They went away from the faith. Yeah. Will they be raptured? So that part we will let God handle. <laughs> you know, because we can't judge. We can't judge. Like where they are, maybe they're confused. Not that they've become unbelievers. See, uh, like say example, there's a believer. He's not suddenly overnight, I mean very rarely overnight he's going to say, I, I've become an unbeliever. Right? Uh, maybe there are some people who may deny the faith completely. But sometimes there'll be people in between, they're a little confused. Sometimes they may be deceived or disturbed by some other people. It's not that they have given up their on their faith in Jesus, but at that moment maybe they're confused, right? So I don't. So that part, you know, we don't know exactly where they are. We let the Lord see because only God can see their heart and know where they are. Those who have openly denied, like Hebrews chapter six, says, you know, they openly deny, they trample underfoot the blood of Jesus. That means they, if they're just uh, uh, totally denying their faith, which they once believed. That, you know, we can say, yeah, that person has gone away from the faith. He has completely denied Jesus Christ. Obviously, he's not saved. He won't. But um, others who may be a little confused, disturbed, is that we leave, let God handle it. He knows their heart. Okay. Okay. So let's move forward now. We're going to go to the next chapter. Uh, this. Chapter number, okay, sorry, I need to finish a few things um, in uh, chapter one itself, uh, which is on page 20. Let me share this um, page 20 on the PDF. So we, what we want to do, um, or what I want to mention now is that um, in the Bible, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, uh, there are different phrases. We are on page 20 in the notes. There are different phrases that are used in relation to the old um, end times. So, and I've just given examples here. Uh, last days, the time of the end, the latter days, day of the Lord, day of wrath, 
last day, end of the age, end of the ages, end of the, sorry, ends of the ages, last hour, coming of the Lord, appearing, revelation of Jesus Christ, when he appears, his coming, and so on, right? Now, uh, there is no one meaning for every phrase. You know, that is just, be, uh, that means uh, we have to understand each phrase depending on its context, right? Uh, what it's exactly referring to. Uh, is it referring to, you know, a time just before the rapture? Or is it referring to a time during the beginning of the tribulation? Or is it referring to a time, end of tribulation? You know, so what exactly that phrase is referring to will depend on the passage in which, which it is used. So I've given all these uh, scriptures here. So we cannot say every time it says his coming, uh, it is referring to the rapture. Because his coming could be, you know, uh, whether a rapture or whether it is the end of the seven years of tribulation. Uh, it, it, it could be. Uh, depending on where it is used, we have to understand. Or it could also refer to the entire period, you know, of the last seven years, the, the tribulation period. So uh, we'll have to interpret each time we read it, depending on the context, right? And uh, yeah, so okay, that's fine. Let's go to the next chapter, which is chapter number two the Middle East and other regions in prophecy. So here uh, in, the, in this chapter, I just want us to just get some idea of the geography that the Bible is really talking about, especially in the context of the end times. Right. So that's the purpose of this chapter. Which parts of the world uh, should we be familiar with? So one, when we say, you know, the Middle East, remember, uh, there are these two great rivers, the, Tig uh, the river Tigris and the Euphrates. And um, the Garden of Eden was somewhere here uh, in, in this area between the Euphrates and the Tigris, right? Somewhere in that region. And uh, Abraham was called out from here. And God then said, I'm going to take you into a land that I'm going to give you as an inheritance. So um, somewhere from this region, alongside the Euphrates River, was the Ur of the Chaldees, or the Chaldeans, um, which would have been part of modern-day Iraq. And from there, God said, Abraham, come. I'll take you to a land that I'll give you. So Abraham made his journey. He made his journey uh, towards the west and then down south. So he moved down to this region that we now know as Israel. Okay, so this whole area, the Middle East, is of in, in interest to us. Uh, the countries that we uh, are looking at would be, of course, Israel. There's Jordan. Uh, there's Syria. Um, there's Turkey up in the north. Lebanon is just north of um, Israel. Iraq. And then on the south is Egypt. So these are areas that are of interest to us. Now, when Daniel prophesied, he prophesied about empires. He talked about the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, then the Greeks. And then he, he mentioned these uh, empires. And then he, he spoke about a, a, another empire that would come very powerful. And all of these empires essentially existed in this part of the world, the Middle East, okay, around the Mediterranean. So uh, again, this area is very uh, of interest to us. So uh, uh, page 21, uh, oh, sorry, page 24, um, after these empires came and went, subsequently uh, Islam uh, became a very powerful force in that part of the world. So today, a lot of the Middle East is Arab, Arab nations, Muslim nations. So literally, Israel is surrounded by Muslim countries, literally. 
right? So because Islam came up in power in that part of the world uh, subsequently, right? So 22 Arab nations uh, are across the Middle East and North Africa. So Israel is literally surrounded by these nations. So if you look in the uh, page 25, you find Israel, such a small, tiny little country, and all around it are all these big and powerful Arab nations, Islam, uh, Muslim countries. And yet it is so interesting that this small nation of Israel is, uh, is almost like it has such a big voice in the Middle East, even though it is surrounded by Arab nations. You know, I mean, if you look at, if you think of it, uh, these Arab nations could literally, if they all got together, they could, uh, they would outnumber Israel very easily if they all got together. But yet, you know, Israel is, seems to have such a powerful voice uh, in the Middle East. Um, and many of these nations in, in, in the Middle East, they can't, they, all became independent, recognized recognizes countries around the same time. In Israel, 1948, Egypt, 1922, Iraq, 1932, Syria, 1945. So all these nations became independent around the same time. So a little bit more on Israel. Um, May 14, 1948, the State of Israel was formed and uh, declared its independence. And uh, a lot of the Jews began to move towards their own home or their the land that um, they they felt was a land given to them by God. Now, the another region that's very of interest to us is the European Union. Um, that you see a little map of that on page twenty six. The former Roman Empire, the old Roman Empire, page 26. So when Daniel prophesied, he talked about an empire or, or a kingdom that would be made of iron. That will be very powerful, more stronger than the previous empires. Now, he didn't mention it by name, but he gave it in sequence. He said, after the Babylonians, there will be the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, and after the Greeks will come another empire which will be made of like very powerful, very of iron. And we, his looking back at history, we can recognize that to be the Roman Empire, which covered most of modern day Europe. So, the the, the map you're seeing on page twenty six, right? Yeah, um, is the colored area is the old. Roman Empire, when it was at its biggest, largest extent. You see that it covered a lot of Northern Africa, it covered all of the Middle East and parts of Europe, a good, a large part of Europe, okay? which today forms part of the European Union. So that's why it's very interesting. And we will read this in Daniel chapter 2, where in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel says, after this powerful empire, this empire will be broken into small, small, small parts. And the iron will be mixed with clay. Clay meaning people from all other parts of the world. And so today, that's exactly the condition of the European Union. All across Europe, you have people who were, you know, you say, okay, they were all descendants of, they were all part of the former Roman Empire. But it's all mixed with people from all other parts of the world. Everybody else is there. You know, so literally, what Daniel said, the iron mixed with clay is what we see all across the European Union. And then he tells us, he says, in the days of this kingdom, God will set up his own kingdom. So it's very interesting. But then he gives us lots of details in the book of Daniel, which we will study in our third year. What we see is from this region will arise 10 leaders. So today, 
many of the leaders of the European Union, I mean, they are, they are world leaders, you know, you said France, Germany, uh, and other, 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 you know, other leaders, prominent leaders, they are recognized leaders there. Yeah. So he says there will be 10 leaders who rise, who will be very prominent from this region. And then there will be a small horn or a small leader who comes, who was part of the former Greek Empire. So the Greek Empire uh, covered parts of Greece, uh, Turkey, um, uh, 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 Syria, and Northern Africa, in that region. So from there will come a small horn, and he will influence three of these ten leaders. Right? And that little horn will be the Antichrist. So for us, looking at what is happening in this part of the world is very interesting, because Daniel prophesied and gave us a lot of details on what is going to happen. You all with me so far? Yeah. So what looking at what's happening in the Middle East, what's happening in Europe is something uh, of interest. And we keep looking at it very carefully. So I've given you the names of the countries here, uh, modern day countries, which were part of the Roman Empire. The ones that are in bold, Greece, Turkey, Syria, and Egypt, are the four major countries which were part of the Greek Empire in that area. So Daniel said, from one of those four regions will come the Antichrist. Now, I've mentioned only these four countries. It doesn't mean it, it, it's exclusively these countries. It's in that region. So there are there are there is some overlap with some other countries, which you know we're not very clear about. But somewhere in that region, uh, the Antichrist will come. Okay, and then there are a list of other uh, countries or territories that were part or in some way influenced by the Roman Empire, which we should also look at. So if you look at modern day map on page 27, you'll find all the modern day countries uh, that, that, that are of interest to us. Okay, So it's good for us uh, to read the news, to see what's happening, uh, see you know what is going on, how the nations are aligning, uh, and so on. Okay, And... Um, yeah, so I, I gave you a summary of what Daniel had prophesied. All right, now page 29, Russia. Another country that we should be looking at is Russia. How, what is Russia doing? How it is aligned, you know, where is it in its relationship with Israel? It's very important, right? So Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel describes that, and it's very interesting, read Ezekiel 38, I would encourage you to read it. Um, he says that there will be this people from the north, and he mentions certain tribes. He mentions Persia, which we know is uh, Iran and Iraq. He mentions Ethiopia, Libya, Goma, which would be past, uh, parts of uh, eastern Germany. He mentions the Garma, which would be Turkey, and he mentions Egypt. So these are uh, um, regions that we need to be uh, looking at. And he talks about uh, people from the north invading Israel. So if you look at the map, you'll find that Moscow is just north straight north of Jerusalem, Russia, straight north. And he talks about those tribes coming in and invading Israel. So we look very carefully how, you know, today uh, the United States supports Israel, Russia, China, North Korea. They are aligning themselves and their Russia aligns itself with Turkey, uh, with some of the Middle Eastern countries. And so they're all aligned. And they oppose the US, UK, and some of the other countries like France and uh, Germany. They oppose. They're not, you know, so it's like on one side you have these countries, on the other side these countries. Um, and so if anything happens, 
it's most likely that Russia, China would all join hands together and go against Israel. So the way these nations are aligned is so interesting because it's almost it's, it's almost exactly like what Ezekiel wrote way back, you know, hundreds of years before Jesus and thousands of years before our time. So Ezekiel wrote in Ezekiel 38, this is the way it's going to be. Here we are almost 2,000 plus years later, and we can see these nations aligned in that manner. Okay, so it's useful if you will um, read Ezekiel 38 and 38, 39, uh, you will see uh, what, uh, how these nations are aligned. Another important part that we need to look at are kings from the east. Because uh, in the book of Revelation, Revelation 9 and also in Revelation 16, um, Revelation 9 talks about an army of about 200, um, it was a 200,000, I think it is. Revelation 9, let me give you the exact number. Um, it says, Revelation 9 and verse 15 and verse 16, 200 million. Revelation 9, 6, now the army of the horsemen were 200 million, right? And this army, uh, later on also we see in Revelation 16, we see the kings of the east, Revelation um, 16 was 12, mm, prepared, so the river Euphrates was dried and the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. So we are seeing an army of 200 million. So we think like, who can have such a big army? 200 million people, horsemen. And then Revelation 12, 12, 16, 12, we are seeing kings from the east. They are preparing to come to attack Israel. So he does not mention by name who this is. Okay, So we don't know. So correctly, we don't know. All we know is it's from the east of Israel. So we so we say, okay, you know, most likely this will include China. Because you have to have an army of 200 million people. So who can have such a big army? Most countries are small, small, small. Russia is big, China is big. So that's one reason why we, you know, we can, although China is not mentioned by name, we say, okay, most likely China is going to be involved. And then he gives us more details saying it's the kings from the east. So we think of all the countries east of Israel, you know, Iraq, Iran, Syria, and then move further, you'll find Russia and China. So these are the kings from the east who will move in to attack. Israel. So that's why we look at how these countries are aligning themselves. And the major countries east of Israel are Russia and China. Right? So kings from the east, 200 million troops, most likely uh, China, Russia, along with other Arab nations. And the Valley of Megiddo is again a very interesting place. Because this is where the Bible tells us is going to be the final battle. So where is the Valley of Megiddo? You'll see a little map on page 30. Uh, the Jezreel Valley, which is north of Jerusalem, north in the northern part of Israel. The Valley of Jezreel. Um, just north of uh, uh, Jerusalem. Yeah. So in that region is this valley where the Bible says the big conflict will take place. Right? So it's like all the armies will come in here. Why here? I don't know. The Bible just foretells it, that this is the place where it's going to be. There's going to be a, a, a great conflict, the Valley of Megiddo, or the Jezreel Valley, where things will take place. And the Battle of Armageddon will take place. The River Euphrates will be dried up. 
and the armies uh, will move from the north, come across here, and there'll be conflict taking place right here in an attempt to destroy Jerusalem and so on. Okay, so that's uh, uh, something to keep in mind. And then there's a little map, page 31. Somebody has put together all the details that uh, we see in scripture. Uh, the river Euphrates dries up, and then that can allow the armies, and of course, you know, uh, the armies moving on ground, on air, but they all converge here in the, va in the valley of Megiddo, or uh, the battle of Armageddon takes place here. And it's at that moment that the Lord Jesus will return. Okay, So these are the areas, the regions that we need to keep in mind. All right, any questions here so far? Yes, um, Francis. Uh, sir, will India will participate with, for anything? Like, uh, you know, like uh, India is a related country of Russia. So, in case India anything needed, the support will come from Russia. So, like anything will happen like us that. Mm. So, how, what, what, I mean, what would be India's role? So, India right now is like, they have very good relations with the US. They also have good relations with Russia. They're balancing in between, <laughs> but not very good relationship with China. But what we do know is in, I think it was in the 1967 war or before, early, earlier, Indian soldiers fought for Israel. And actually, the, if you look into the details, uh, the Indian, one particular Indian regiment was very, very instrumental in helping fight for Israel. Um, I think it's a 1967 war, one of those wars. So Indian soldiers were fighting for Israel at that time. And uh, India also has a good relationship in terms with Israel because they get a lot of the military intelligence from Israel. Uh, a lot of the learning comes, the knowledge, uh, technical knowledge comes from Israel as well, along with other countries. So. India is trying to maintain, you know, good relations with, with the U.S., with Russia, with Israel. And so uh, what role will India play? Where will India be? I don't know. Because it's kind of balancing everybody, you know, keeping good relationships on all sides. Uh, historically, yes, India supported Israel and they fought for Israel, Indian soldiers. Uh, how will it be in the future? We don't know. Uh, where, you know, what position India is going to take. Um, but practically, you find that, you know, India's connections with the US seems to be stronger. There's a lot more US investment here. A lot of more uh, Amer American companies coming and establishing here than Russia. It used to be we used to have good ties with Russia, but now economically we seem to be much better with the United States. But what actually will happen, uh, where, what role India will play, I'm not sure. You know, we'll see. Okay. Any questions from online? So this, um, we have one more lesson on a little bit of history, just to give us background before we start looking at the scriptures, um, which we will cover quickly in the next lesson. Now let me just get started here. So just a few more minutes and then we'll go for a break. Let me just uh, share a little bit from the next chapter. So chapter two was introducing us to a little bit of the geography Chapter 3 is a little bit of the history. So what actually happened here? So uh, God called Abraham from uh, this area, the Mesopotamia, uh, Mesopotamia that's along the river uh, Euphrates, between the river, rivers Euphrates and Tigris. He called Abraham from here, and he, and he led him to what we know as Israel. And at that time, the promise that God made uh, to Abraham was, He said, yeah, "Let's." If you look at Genesis 15, verse 18, He said, "The land between the great 
river Euphrates and the river Egypt, the land between um, uh, the Nile, the river of Egypt, and the river Euphrates, that whole land I'm giving to you. Okay. So that's why people of Israel say this is our land. Because God promised it to Abraham. Right? And sure enough, that is exactly where they are. They don't have all of it. Some of it, you know, uh, on the south, Egypt is holding on to some part of it. Uh, other parts are, you know, there's a lot of conflict going on right now. So, but a major portion of it, they're there. They're having it for themselves. But the land, the region, God said, Genesis 15, 18, from Euphrates till Nile, I will give it to you. From uh, Euphrates to the river of Egypt. Okay, um, so that is the region they um, uh, Israel sees. The other uh, uh, important thing, yeah. So we we read about you know God bringing them back to the land of promise, and there He gave them His feasts, um, the feasts that they were to keep, and uh, very important is uh, the, um, what happened during David's time when he. I should say, okay, let um, when when he prepare, made preparation for the temple, and Solomon built the first temple about 1000 BC, right? So this is on page 32. So around 1000 BC, thousand years before Christ, Solomon built the temple, right? Um, so that is very very important. Because that land where Solomon built the temple, today now, as we understand it, is is is, is occupied by um, the the mosque and uh, the Dome of the Rock, which are uh, Muslim sites. Anyway, so after Solomon, uh, the kingdom was divided. Uh, the Assyrians came; they attacked Israel. After Assyrians came the Babylonians, uh, King Cyrus gave the issue around 539 BC to go and rebuild the temple and the city. So the temple was rebuilt. So we refer to it as a second temple, which was rebuilt uh, by Zerubbabel and Nehemiah, rebuilt the walls around uh, 450 BC. And then there was um, Alexander the Great, the Greek Empire. Then there was the Seleucid Empire. Um, then came the Romans. And then came... Um, uh, so during that time, King Herod was there, Jesus was born, and uh, um, the second temple was destroyed around 70 AD by the Romans. So the second temple it was destroyed. Then the, the we see the rise of Islam in and around the Middle East, around 600 AD. And uh, Jerusalem was captured, and around 690 AD, the Dome of the Rock was built at the same site where um, uh, they, there was the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, uh, the, 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 there was a wave of people returning back into um Israel, around the 1800s and 1900s, uh, Jewish people began to return, uh, establish themselves. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, let me see now. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the uh, the um, the Arab uh, the uh, then came the Ottoman Empire. Again, it was an Arab or Muslim empire. And that empire was overthrown by the British. Uh, the British defeated the Turks uh, around 1917. Um, so that's the time the transition happened. And then in 1948, the British moved out and uh, Israel declared itself as an independent state, uh, as a country. So that, that happened. Then there were subsequent battles of wars. Um, and I think the most important would be the Six-Day War in 1967, 
when uh, Jerusalem was recaptured by Israel. And this, is, uh, this was an amazing uh, moment for Israel because there were three armed, there were uh, the Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Lebanon. So we're talking about five neighboring countries against one country. Right? So Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, Lebanon fighting against Israel. And Israel actually pushed them all back and took more territory. So they took Jerusalem back uh, and North Golan Heights, and it just took more region. So six, uh, five or six, um, five of these countries coming against Israel, and Israel is pushing them back. So that was very, very, as uh, I would say, decisive that these countries realized that Israel is actually very strong, very powerful militarily. They can't, you know, even though it's a small country, they couldn't push it down. And so that, that was a turning point there. Okay. So let's pause here, go for a break. We'll come back and just, you know, just touch on some of the key things about uh, his historical information before we go forward. Okay. Thank you. 